I'll try scooting over a little bit so everybody can see uh, from all around. Um, we are continuing in our series in the book of Judges. This is a fascinating book. I love looking at the, the history of the Israelites and seeing what happened uh, to them. And as we continue to look, we are looking at the corruption of their hearts. We're looking to see what we can do to not fall into those same traps, to fall into those same issues and fall away. And we are in Judges 10 this morning, Judges chapter 10. And we're looking at what, what will lead to the next judge, uh, Jephthah. We're going to look and see how we get to him. But we're going to start... Uh, looking there in chapter 10 at what caused uh, God to raise up this judge. And we're going to start in verse 6. Judges chapter 10, verse 6. And it's, and it's written this. Then the Israelites, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshipped the Baals and the Asherahs, the gods of Aram, Sidon, and Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites and the Philistines. They abandoned the Lord and did not worship him. I love how they worded that here. Then the Israelites, again, I almost feel like they wrote it with that emphasis, and they did it again. They fell, and they did what was evil in God's sight. They turned their hearts against God. They've allowed their hearts to be corrupted. And what's interesting this time is the response God gives. The response God gives, and we see it there in verses 7 through 9. Again, still Judges 10, and it says this. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he sold them to the Philistines and the Ammonites. They shattered and crushed the Israelites that year, and for 18 years they did the same to all the Israelites who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites in Gilead. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. Israel was greatly oppressed. You know what's interesting? Every time Israel starts worshiping idols, they tell in there whose gods they're worshiping. And whosoever gods they're worshiping is the is the nation, is the group of people that God allows to take them over. This time they started worshiping the gods of the, the Ammonites and the Philistines. And that's who took them over. So before we start looking at the repentance part, our focus is on repentance today. And before we start talking about repentance, I want us to talk about why we need to repent. My first point this morning, adultery leads to enslavement. See, adultery leads us into slavery, slavery to sin. Listen to what God said here again, verses 6 and 7. The Israelites di again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshipped the Baals and the Asherahs, the god of Aram, Sidon, and Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites and the Philistines. They abandoned the Lord and did not worship him. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he sold them to the Philistines and the Ammonites. God sold them to their sin. And this isn't the first time this has happened. We go back and look throughout Judges. It's not the first time. Judges 2.14, the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he handed them over to marauders who raided them. He sold them to the enemies around them, and they could no longer resist their enemies. Judges 3.8, the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he sold them to King Rishathiam of Aram Naharaim, and the Israelites served him eight years. Judges 4.2, so the Lord sold them to King Jabin of Canaan, who, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Hashaseth, 
of the nations, Harosheth of the nations. There's a lot of crazy words in the book of Judges, a lot of crazy names. You know, when you sell something, like if I were to sell, oh, for example, I sold Bill my Honda. Once I sold it to Bill, Bill now can do whatever he wants with that Honda. And he's fixed a number of things that I didn't think were fixable, but he's got it taken care of and it looks pretty good. It's running, it's running very well. Am I right, Bill? He's the new owner. He can do with that Honda as he wants. God sold these people to their sin. Now, when God sold them over, it doesn't mean he abandoned them. It doesn't mean he nullified his promise with him. It didn't mean he ended the covenant. It didn't mean he stopped protecting them in some way. But he let those things that owned the people dominate them, own them. We see it similarly in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, we find Paul talking about how God is seen throughout all creation, and yet the people chose to live differently. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 23 says this. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless, and their senselessness, senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. They knew God. They, they knew who he was. But just like the people of Israel, just like people today, they thought they knew better. So what happened? Well, we read it here in verses 24 and 25 of Romans 1. Therefore, God delivered them over in their desires of their heart to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. The word desire in the Greek, epithemia is the word. Epithemia. We have desire here. That Greek word has such a deeper meaning for desire. It's an overwhelming drive, an enslaving, uncontrollable desire. Not just desire, but desire. And so the people that God was talking about, or Paul was talking about in Romans 1, they gave into their adultery and they were enslaved to sin. See, here's the thing. Adultery and slavery go hand in hand. Think about it this way. The person who is just all about money, that's all they want is money. That's all they're concerned about. That is the number one thing in their life is money. God says to that person who worships money, if you want to live for money instead of me, then money is going to rule your life. It will control your heart. It will control your emotions. And we see that in Scripture. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus' words. No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Say the person's idol is fame, is popularity. If you want to live for popularity instead of God, God will say, okay, it will consume you. It will control you. 
In John 12, 43, Jesus says, For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Just step back and think about that. John 12, 43. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, again, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. We can't have two masters. We can't serve both. We can't have dual idolships of God and whatever it is we want. It's just like when Jesus talks in Revelation about we can't be lukewarm. Oh, we can be, but if we are, then we're choosing not him. And God detests that even more, that you try to ride the fence, that you try to be lukewarm. You either worship God or you worship your idol. One or the other. But God says, if that's what you want to do, worship your idol, go ahead. Let's see how merciful this idol is to you. Let's see how effective this idol is in saving you. Is your idol going to save you? No, it's not. We're asking a created thing or a created idea to save you when the only one that can save us is the creator, is God. But Paul gives us hope. Paul gives us hope when he writes in Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal in Christ Jesus our Lord. We must strive to be devoted to God and not devoted to the idols, whatever that idol is. And we all have different idols that we may struggle with, different things that we struggle with. But once we sin, we need to repent. We need to repent. But here's my question. What is the motivation for some people when they call out for repentance? when they say they want to repent. See, some people have all the wrong reasons. Repentance is a change of heart. It is a complete change of heart. I think of Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verses 10 and 17. These are words that David penned after he was caught in sin. After he was caught and he had, people had found out, or he had found out, it had been made public that he had committed adultery and murder. And David penned these words. God, create in me, create a clean heart for me, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humble heart, God. Repentance is change. We should want a clean heart instead of a tainted heart. We should want a humbled heart instead of a proud, arrogant heart. See, the people of Israel at first were not showing repentance. And we find it here in verses 10 through 14 of Judges 10. Judges chapter 10, verses 10 through 14, it says this. So they cried out to the Lord saying, we have sinned against you. We have abandoned our God and worshiped the Baals. 
The Lord said to the Israelites, when the Egyptians, Amorites, Ammonites, Philistines, Sidonians, Amalekites, and the Maonites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, did I not deliver you from them? But you've abandoned me and worshipped other gods. Therefore, I will not deliver you again. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them deliver you whenever you're oppressed. God saw right through them. They weren't repentant. They only wanted help because they were in trouble. They still wanted the sin that they were living in. But they knew God could get them out of it. So, oh, God, can you help us this time? How about it again? Can you please help us again? They weren't feeling remorse for their sin. They were just sorry they got caught. They were just sorry they got caught. And that is two different things. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. A salvation without regret. But worldly grief produces death. Worldly grief. I'm sorry I got caught. What do I have to do to get out of this? God save me, but let me keep on doing what I was doing. That's okay. It's fine, isn't it? It's not really that bad. I think of King Saul when I think of stuff like this. King Saul was, he was a character. And when the time that the prophet Samuel confronted him, See, Saul was supposed to lead a victory over the Amalekites. And they were supposed to destroy everything, bring nothing back. And well, Saul greets Samuel, when Samuel approaches, he, he greets him like there's nothing wrong, everything's fine, everything's good. And then Samuel goes, why do I hear animals? In other words, Samuel's letting on, I know what you did. You got the victory but now you're taking the step we told you not to take. And so Samuel calls him out. He says, why'd you disobey God? And listen to Saul's response. First Samuel chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. And he says this, but I did obey the Lord, Saul answered. I went on the mission the Lord gave me. I brought back King Agag of Amalek. I completely destroyed the Amalekites. The troops took sheep, goats, and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was set apart for destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Then Samuel said, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and defiance is like wickedness and adultery. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Saul saying, what did I do wrong? Hey, we were really going to bring this stuff over and give sacrifices to God. It's good. Everything's great. Everything's fine. And Samuel says, that's not what God told you to do. You're trying to pass the blame. You're trying to blame the soldiers for bringing these things, and you let it go on. You said it was okay. There was no sign of repentance. It was the blame game. What we need, like Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, is that godly repentance. True repentance, which is my third point this morning. True repentance. And that's actually what we find back here in Judges 10 with the story of these Israelites who are needing a judge. Judges 10, verses 15 and 16. After God has made this response to them saying, go pray to one of those other gods you're praying to, the Israelites turn around and said this. Judges 10, verses 15 and 16. But the Israelites said, we have sinned. 
Deal with us as you see fit. Only rescue us today. So they got rid of the foreign gods among them and worshiped the Lord. And he became weary of Israel's misery. Israel wasn't looking to make a deal anymore. They weren't looking to pass the blame. They had moved past the point of being sorry they got caught. They told God, do with us as you see fit. They're surrendering. They're giving God control. And they did that. They got rid of those gods. They started actually worshiping the Lord. We find here Israel was ready to repent. As we repent, as we change in our ways, we start seeing those good qualities come out. We see good qualities from repentance. The opportunity to come into the light. The opportunity to admit our sin and admit that we committed them, that we did wrong. We're not trying to wiggle out of them. I love the words of John in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-10. through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We walk in the light, because when we're repenting, when we're truly repenting, we have nothing to hide. We're bearing it all. We're saying, I did this. I did that, I did this, yes. We're not hiding anymore. It's so easy to want to hide in the shadows. We don't want people to see what we're doing. How, how, what, we, could, we can't do that. We walk in the light when we're transparent. When we're honest with God, when we're honest with our fellow brothers and sisters, when we're just simply honest. That's what happens when we repent. When we repent, we also start relinquishing control. We understand that we're going to be disciplined and we treasure it because we know it's worth it. And hey, I'll tell you, when we talk discipline, when I was a kid, I got that belt a couple times. I didn't like it at the time. But as I'm older, I knew I, knew I deserved it. I knew those times that I got it, and I didn't get them. I didn't get, uh, I didn't get that too often, but when I did, I had, done some, I had done something wrong. We must be willing for that discipline, the consequence for our actions, and we must be willing to accept them. Roman, or Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, we read this. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us, and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them. But he does it for our benefit, so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. 
Later on, however, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Repentance is change. A change of our heart, a change of our soul. A change to a pure heart from a corrupted heart. And that's only done through God and our willingness to submit to Him. Israel figured it out then. This group finally figured it out. And now they're ready to meet their next judge. We read at the end of Judges 10, verses 17 and 18, it says this, The Ammonites were called together, and they encamped in Gilead. So the Israelites assembled and camped at Mitzvah. The rulers of Gilead said to one another, Which man will begin the fight against the Ammonites? He will be the leader of all the inhabitants of Gilead. And as we enter chapter 11, we're going to read about that man, Jephthah. And we're going to find out his story, and it's an interesting story. But as we close here, I want to remind you of Peter's words when he talked about repentance. Because we need repentance. We need our hearts to change. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Our hearts need to change. Our lives need to change. We can't just say, yes, I'll follow God, and then do nothing. And then live how we're living. That's what these Israelites were doing. They were saying, God, save us, but we want to live how we were. It doesn't work that way. And God's telling them that. It doesn't work that way. We want to give our life to God? We need to repent. Be baptized and start new. Have a pure heart. Yes, we've sinned. We have allowed our hearts to be corrupted because of sin. But God will wash us new. If we choose to repent. Our lives need to change, and it's only going to be done through the blood of Jesus. Right now, we're going to offer a time of invitation. If you need to repent, if you haven't repented already, now's the time to come forward to give your life to Him. We're going to sing, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. Lord, have your way in me. That's what it means to repent. We're no longer saying our way is right, but God's way is the only way. If you need to do that this morning, won't you sing or won't you come forward as we sing?